good evening, everybody. I think that is my cue to get started. Uh, my name is Sam Blake, and I am beaming to you from Dublin. Uh, and I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by three amazing writers uh, to talk to you on behalf of the Reading Agency. And we're going to be digging deep into their books, uh, which I have read. I have loved every single one. Uh, first up, we have Leslie Cara. She's a Sunday Times bestselling author of psychological suspense novels. Her debut, The Rumour, was the highest selling crime fiction debut of 2019 in the UK and a Kindle number one bestseller. It's been published in 18 countries and optioned for TV. And since then, she's written a further three novels. Who Did You Tell? I got that right, haven't I? Yeah, The Dare, and most re recently, The Apartment Upstairs. Uh, Leslie worked for many years as a lecturer and manager in a large uh, college of further education in London, and she now lives in Suffolk and writes full time. So we've also got with us Sam Lloyd. Uh, he grew up in Hampshire where he, he learned his love of storytelling. Uh, these days he lives in Surrey with his wife, three young sons and a dog, which we've been just talking about off air before we came here. Uh, his thrillers The Memory Wood and The Rising Tide were published to critical acclaim in 2020 and 2021. I really should be holding them all up as I'm introducing them. That's Sam's The Rising Tide. Highly recommended. And Leslie, here you are. You've got a gorgeous hardback. So that's so that everybody can see they've, they've come out in reverse, haven't they, on the video, but so everybody can see them. Um, Ex-barrister Charity Norman was born in Uganda and raised in the UK and currently lives in a wooden cabin in rural New Zealand with her husband and too many cats. Her best-selling novels include BBC Radio 2, Rich and Judy World Book Night titles. She's twice been shortlisted for the New, New Zealand's Nagio Marsh Awards for Best Novel and for Best International Crime Fiction in the Australian Ned Kelly Awards. Her seventh and latest book, Remember, me was released in March this year. That's the cover there. I have to try and angle it so you can see it properly. Um, and Charity is the mother of three almost grown children, and she loves hearing from readers on her social accounts, which we'll, we'll try and remember to get to the end so we can tell everybody who everybody's where, where, where they can follow you guys online. Um, I wanted to have a chat to you. I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of reading during the course of this uh, time here. Uh, so do have your books ready uh, because I really want one of the, the, so the big things as I was reading these books was the, was the fact that your voices are all very, very different. And I really want everybody to be able to hear that um, and hear how different the books are. And yet the one thing they all have in common is this incredible suspense. Uh, so I want to get to the bottom of that. First of all, I'd like to, to just to talk to you a little bit about the inspiration for the stories, because they're all really quite unique. Um, Leslie, yours is um, a really twisty story yeah. with the most amazing characters. Um, Scarlett is our lead character. Her aunt has been murdered in the flat upstairs, the apartment upstairs. Um, but you've got some amazing characters. You've got uh, Dee and Lindsay who run the Fond Farewell Funeral Parlour, who, who get a look in, in the story too. So just to talk through th those main characters. Scarlett's really interesting to me because she has chronic a chronic um, pain situation, doesn't she? Um, and it's the first time I've come across that. Yes, she does. Um, Scarlett is a sort of 40 something accountant actually, who suffers from ME. And um, I, I don't know why I gave her that sort of chronic condition. I think really she just appeared to me. It sounds a bit sort of <laughs> nutty really, but she just appeared to me when I was actually sitting on a bus um, and I, I lived in the part of London where this novel is set. I, I know Charlton and Greenwich and Plumstead very well. And um, I was sitting on a bus looking out of the window at these sort of houses. And I just sort of had an image of this woman um, with a walking cane. And um, I don't know why that was. I think it was probably because I'd been following an account on Instagram with a woman who often sort of shows pictures of herself with a her walking cane and is very positive, you know, about yeah. her, her disability. And um, so I, I, I suppose I have always been interested in characters with hidden disabilities, because in The Dare, my main character had um, epilepsy. And in Who Did You Tell, I wrote about a recovering alcoholic. So I guess that sort of theme of hidden disability is one that interests me. Um, as for Dee, the funeral, um, the, the undertaker, um, I had a friend, well, I have a friend, um, an ex-colleague of mine, a former colleague, I should say, um, who retrained. She, she was working in the same college of further education where I worked and she retrained as a funeral celebrant. Wow. And so I was really interested in that sort of um, that profession of hers and, and the growing trends in the funeral industry, you know, the move to greener, more um, environmentally friendly funerals. Um, so I was quite, um, yeah, I wanted to sort of include something about that. And of course, when I chanced upon the idea of um, Scarlett's uh, aunt being murdered, 
I thought, well, you know, it's interesting in terms of if you were arranging a funeral for somebody who's been murdered, that must be incredibly difficult because not only have you got the grief of them, you know, the, the, the loss of the person, but you've also got, you know, all the, all the police investigation and the, the body not being released for some while. So I thought that was an interesting, interesting premise. Um, it's a so, brilliant starting so, point, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, and you're there with her on the bus. At exactly. the start of the novel. So it's yeah. just so I can completely see. I love the way she's arrived um, in your head and a, a sort of fully formed character. Um, that's that's fabulous. Um, Sam, when you were thinking about Lucy and um, the various, um, I, I love this book and the talk about twists that are going on. I mean, you're all got twists, but uh, Sam's, I didn't get I didn't guess any of them. Um, so t when Lucy arrived in your head, where did you start off with that, with the story for The Rising Tide? Well, um, the rising tide was funny, really, because usually I usually I do start off with a character or I start off with a scene in my head um, and actually progress from there. But the rising tide was completely different. I'd, I'd written down this paragraph of, of, of writing probably about 15 years ago, and I'd written down another paragraph of writing about the same time. And they just they were just in the back of my head the whole time. These the, the start of the book. Um, and eventually I decided I, what I need to do is sit down with these two paragraphs and connect them. And actually the, the, the course of writing was connecting that first paragraph, is, which, which now appears as the, the very first paragraph in the first chapter with the second paragraph, which ended up being the, the first paragraph of the last chapter. Ooh, and, yeah. and so, uh, and, and I didn't really know where I, was go where I was going when I sat down just with that first paragraph. I, I knew that I wanted to tell a story about someone who received some shocking news and they are they are just trying to deal in the first you know couple of minutes of, of of receiving that shocking news with that when they receive some even more shocking news and some even more shocking news and the, the hits kind of keep coming um, and they're just struggling to, to to catch up and to try and try and get on top of things. Excellent. And and that, and that really is the case of this novel. You just that, because things do keep coming. I mean, literally one thing after another, um, all the way through. It's and it's set in. I'm going to talk to you guys about location in a minute because I think location is really significant in all the books. Um, but I think it's set in Devon, isn't it? Is it? I couldn't guess yeah. quite where it yeah, was. A, a fictional North Devon town. Yeah. Uh, and um, and Lucy, who's the main character, she is a a mother and a wife, and she uh, owns this really successful beachside bar that's really the hub of the, the town during uh, tourist season. Yeah, the that's why the title I think is so appropriate because um, it really is all about the sea and the boat and the various things that, uh, that, that pan out in Lucy's life. Um, Charity, Dr. Felix Kirtland is an amazing character. This doctor, he, he, he's descending into Alzheimer's. Um, Emily, his daughter has to come from London, is summoned really from, not a uh, guilt trip is a horrible word, but she really is dragged from London really a little bit by um, the family friend. Uh, is it Ray Wynn who lives next door? Oh. Yeah, um, lives next door, I say, but these are, we're in New Zealand in your book, aren't we? And, it, and they're, I can imagine big, yeah, big next door isn't exactly next door. Um, but he's an amazing character. He's fascinating, isn't he? How did, who came first when you were thinking about that? Um, yeah. Me? Uh, Leslie was talking about putting different characters and, and getting them together, and I suppose mm -hmm. it, it was quite a similar process for me. Dr. Felix Kirkland, um, I think I, to think about where he came from, I need to go back to about um, 2016, when uh, my own mother had Alzheimer's disease, and as I'm sure you've all been touched by it in one way or another, I'm sure everybody watching this has as well, and it's progressive and it's awful and you lose a person bit by bit. Mm -hmm. And um, she finally died in 2016, and I went to um, went back to England. Actually, got the news on the way over, and I was um, helping to organise the funeral um, and clearing out her things. And I found some of her diaries from years earlier, and they weren't personal, so I thought it would be okay to you know to look at them. And you know, what was interesting about them was that she was writing things down in an attempt to remember who she was. She was writing down a list of what her children were called, what her husband was called, the little girl from the kinder transport that they'd looked after when she was a, a tiny child in the, you know, in the um, early 40s. And um, uh, I used to play the violin, I used to be a teacher, this kind of thing. And so when I read that, I realized uh, that although there'd been a lot of paddling under the surface for a long time with my mother, we hadn't realized for a long time, but the years that these were dated, she obviously was already well aware that her mind was going. She was trying to hold on to it. 
And although she was able to um, put up a good front with, I have to say, with the help of my dad, um, who I'm sure knew, this was what was happening. So years later, when I was thinking about, you know, what to write next, um, and I was thinking about the Ruahine Ranges, where, which is a place I wanted to set a book, and I was thinking about people going missing and how you, there's different ways of going missing. You can lose yourself mm-hmm. even when you're physically still here. And this came back to me, I suppose, and um, I began to think about who could it be, who, who would be, who would be um, losing themselves, and I came up with Dr. Kirkland. And once he had begun, well, like with Leslie, once he had begun to arrive, he, he, he arrived in, in full Technicolor, <laughs> you know, and, and couldn't be, um, and nobody else was going to take his place. Yeah, it's a fantastic character. And through, all through the book, his diaries are something which they're incredibly poignant, actually, as Emily finds them and reads them um, and unearths all sorts of things in his study, um, at the, which and they become very significant in the plot um, as we progress. Um, so I just, yeah, though, all of you have beautiful detail in the books. It's the detail, I think, that I really, really enjoyed most, like the diaries. Um, for, for Scarlett has the details sort of her, her relationship, her walking stick and how she copes with the ME and how she goes up and down. Um, they're all really really well realized and the sea um sam my husband's a sailor and so just the you nailed the sea and the lifeboats and that's that sense of place i think really really well so for me the detail and i think for anybody who's watching if you love a book with detail then absolutely please get hold of all of these because they are they're multi-layered they're not just stories they're, there's loads going on as well um i think that's probably a good point for us to just hear a little bit um of each one um leslie do you want to kick us off i'm going around my and you you don't know the order i'm in my screen here but I'm going around uh, clockwise on my screen so okay. do you want to kick us off and just read a little bit so that yes. you can get a sense I'm going to read the first words. chapter my chapters are very short so don't worry and uh, <laughs> and I've also abridged it slightly so it's it's quite short okay so chapter one the bus idled in traffic scarlet rubbed a circle in the steamed up window soon she would be level with the crime scene the house where the bedroom bloodbath had occurred At least that's what it had been called in some of the more lurid headlines. There was nothing the tabloids liked better than a grisly murder. Scarlett wasn't the only passenger craning her neck to get a better view. The couple on the seat in front of her was looking too, and the old guy in front of them. The police tape had long since gone, but flowers were still heaped on the pavement outside. She couldn't recall having seen roadside tributes like these when she was a child, but they were becoming increasingly common. When Fusilier Lee Rigby had been murdered further along this same stretch of road near Woolwich Barracks, the flowers had been there for months on end, flags too. But that had been different. He'd been a young soldier hacked to death in an act of terrorism. Nobody wanted to forget that. Nobody would forget that. Rebecca Quilter's murder had been equally shocking. A 56-year-old woman beaten to death by her fiancé. Just one of so many women killed by their partners. Scarlett had been reading the statistics and they were staggering. Two women a week in England and Wales alone. But domestic homicide was soon forgotten in favour of the next big story. In Rebecca's case, the Nationals had already moved on. Scarlett studied the Victorian house with interest, her eyes lingering on the large bay window on the first floor. An involuntary shudder travelled down her spine. They said she'd been attacked as she slept, bludgeoned with the baseball bat she kept under her bed in case of intruders. The reporters had made much of that fact, the irony of it. At least the spineless bastard had finished himself off too, slit his wrists and bled out. Scarlet closed her eyes and forced the images away. The bus lurched forward, nosing its way slowly through the traffic. Scarlet hoisted her rucksack over her shoulder and shuffled to the edge of the seat. She pressed the button and waited for the bus to stop. Some drivers were apt to pull away before she'd made it to the doors. Not all of them noticed her walking cane until it was too late. On the pavement, she did the buttons up on her raincoat and headed back towards the zebra crossing. As she neared the house where the murder had taken place, the stench of rotten lilies reached her nostrils. A part of her would have liked to pause and read the messages on the cards, but another part couldn't bear to look. Sympathy for the misfortunes of others was understandable, but when it spilled over into mawkishness, it left a sour taste in her mouth. 
One of the cellophane wrapped bouquets had fallen in front of the pathway leading up to the front door, a particularly tasteless arrangement of garish chrysanthemums and frilly carnations. Scarlet nudged it away with her cane. Her heartbeat quickened. Her brother had been right in one respect. She should never have come here alone, not this first time. You're so stubborn, he'd said, but he had been wrong about not coming back at all. She reached into her pocket for her key, walked up to the front door and unlocked it. This was her home. She had to come back sometime. Goodness me, it's just, I yeah, love it. It's great. It just gives us that huge sense that every, every one of the books is a page turner and that one we just have to know what she's going to find inside and more about her. I think the fact her stubbornness is a really lovely thing to have to make because that's something that comes through. She's very stubborn, isn't she? And it comes through the whole yes. story um, as things progress. <clears throat> so that's fantastic. Um, now, uh, Sam, do you want to go next? I will do, yeah. I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read a very short passage, actually, from from the start of this book, and I'm going to tee it up a little bit. Um, it's a, it comes in the form of a letter to Lucy, who's the the main character, and Lucy lives, as I said earlier, in this in this seaside town. And when the book starts, uh, a the, this world world record breaking storm is a, is about to make landfall, and Lucy's about to learn three things. Uh, firstly, that her husband took the family yacht out to sea a few hours earlier. Uh, the second thing she'll learn is that um, the yacht's been found drifting and he made a, uh, a mayday call a few hours ago and the Coast Guard have found the boat, but they haven't found anyone on it. And then the third thing she finds out is that before he, he, he went out to sea, he picked up both her children from school. Um, <laughs> she's yeah. A, yeah, things are about to get very bad for, for Lucy. They are. This is gonna be one of those letters you'll never read. Maybe because I'll burn it. Maybe because it will go down with the boat. I've given this a lot of thought. If there was another way, believe me, I'd try. It's tough when two people have this much shared history. It's so hard to cause pain, even short-term pain, even if it's the right thing to do. The coming storm will be the most difficult you'll ever face. At points, I'm sure it'll feel unbearable. You'll think it's too much, that you don't have the strength to cope. But I know you, Lucy. Your strength runs deep. You've survived tough times before, and you'll survive this. Pain can be purifying. Do you remember telling me that? Suffering can be cathartic. But first, you'll find this hard to forgive. But give it a year, maybe two, and you'll think differently. You'll look back and see I was right, that this was the best solution for all of us. Goodness me. And then it just keeps unfolding and unfolding. And then, yes, as you say, she discovers that her children were that just that was just like that undid me as well. Um, she discovers her daughter, her children, her young son, Finn, who's only eight. Uh, and there's a gorgeous description of him with his little sticky out ears and um, He's, he's sort of he uh, nerdiness sounds awful but he really is he's just gorgeous isn't he and billy the older child too her teenager so um yes it's a terrifying story again and then and like leslie's department upstairs it's very much as that we've, we've we have this sense of suspense the whole time moving through which is something which also is in remember me charity isn't it so just give us a little window on on your book too and we'll see how how it unfurls we've got a reading for us I've got a reading for you. Yes, th th this is from the prologue to the book, um, which really sets up um, the whole the whole sort of background to it. It's dated 17th of June, 1994. I envy you, she says. She doesn't. Why would she envy me? She's Dr. Leia Parata, five years older and infinitely effortlessly superior. Everything about the woman screams energy and competence, even the way she's twirling that turquoise beanie around her index finger. She's tall, light on her feet, all geared up for backcountry hiking in a black jacket or maybe navy blue, as I'll later tell the police. Waterproof trousers, walking boots with red laces, hair in a heavy plait, though a few dark tendrils have escaped. I really do, she insists. You've bought your ticket to Ecuador. What an adventure. Hope so. I know so. She grabs a bar of Cadbury's from the display and holds it up to show me. Got a craving. I didn't know you were an alcoholic. 
just when it's cold. This should keep me going all the way to Bidoff's. I've only once managed to haul myself up to Bidoff's Bivy, a ramshackle hut on the bush line built about a hundred years ago for professional rabbiters. They must have been hardy people. As I count her change, I peer out at the weather, standing water on the petrol station forecourt, raindrops bouncing high off the mustard coloured paintwork of her car. The ranges are smothered in charcoal cloud as though some monstrous creature is breathing out giant plumes of smoke. Seriously, I ask, you're heading up there today? She takes a casual glass, glance at the cloud cover. It seems to delight her. Lucky me, eh? Perfect weather for finding marchant snails. The first wet days after a dry spell bring them out. I've got a happy weekend ahead of me, crawling around in the leaf litter. I can't imagine why anyone would choose to tramp through those rain-soaked forests and uplands, but then I've never been a mountain woman. Leia is, of course. She took her very first steps in the Ruahine range. To her, that wilderness is home. She's going on and on about her snails while I smile and nod. They're this big, holding up her fingers to demonstrate. Carnivorous. She catches me blanching at the image of a giant flesh-eating snail. Okay, maybe not the sexiest of our native creatures, but their shells are works of art. They've been around for millions of years and now they're in trouble because everything preys on them. Possums, rats, pigs, blah, 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 I think, because I'm 21 and empty-headed and I've been jealous of Leia for as long as I can remember. Her teeth are a bit crooked. She has a high forehead, a mole on her left cheekbone and a permanent concentration crease, a vertical line between her eyebrows. Yet somehow these imperfections add to the hypnotic effect. I can see why my brother Eddie's had a crush on her ever since he first clapped eyes on her, swimming her horse in the Arapito stream. They were both 11 then, and he was a scrawny kid from Leeds, but he still hasn't given up hope. Just as she's opening the door to leave the shop, she drops her chocolate, oops, and swiftly stoops to pick it up again, flashing a wide, warm smile at me. Ecuador, she says, good for you, Emily. I'll see you before I go, I call after her. I'm not sure she's heard me. She's striding across the flooded forecourt, pulling the beanie onto her head. The turquoise looks vivid, even through rain streaming glass. She checks her watch before getting into her car. I'll bet she's already forgotten our conversation. She'll be thinking about her snails, about what she's got to achieve over the weekend. Her brake lights flicker at the exit. Now she's accelerating away, water rising in sheets as her wheels bounce through the flooded hollows. They never found Leia Parata. Not a boot, not a backpack, not a turquoise beanie. After she left me that day, she vanished off the face of the earth. That's a brilliant place to start because that's it. Remember Me is about, yeah, missing people, the disappearance, not only of Felix and his mind, but of Leia as well. Uh, and that turquoise beanie becomes very significant and that whole scene becomes very significant as the story plays out. Um, so, yeah, massive, massive suspense. Um, and anybody who's reading um, your book, Charity, needs to do it with tissues next to them <laughs> because I was sobbing at the end, absolutely sobbing. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it begins, yeah, I should, I really should be a health warning on the car. But uh, I think that's, that's, you know that they all they're all intriguing and very very suspenseful Leslie you mentioned there when you started reading that your chapters are all very short um is that something you do consciously to try and move us through the story it is yes I don't know whether I do it consciously I think that just seems to be how I work when I write you know some people have certain word counts they like to maintain each day I've never been like that I tend to write in scenes and so I I if I like to write a chapter a day, it's it, that tends to be, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, no more than a thousand words a day. That would be great if I do that. So, yeah, but also short chapters. I like reading books with short chapters. And I noticed that more and more of um, sort of crime fiction novels did tend to have shorter chapters. And I think it is a way of increasing the pace and getting people to think, oh, I'll just turn out, you know, turn over one more page. One more chapter, yeah. One more chapter before I go to go to sleep um so yeah I, I think that sort of is something I I it's a it's a mixture I intend to do it and it seems to be the natural length of 
words I do in in a day. <laughs> it certainly clipped me along. I was I was flying through the through the apartment upstairs, and you alternate the the points of view, don't you? So we have um, Scarlett initially, and then we go to D and her funeral home situation. Was that a conscious decision when you were thinking about whose whose story it was and and how you were going to tell the story? Yes, I wanted to have the two women's voices, um, and it's the first novel I've written in the third person. Most of my others have been in the first person, and there is actually a third woman, but of course we don't ever meet her. There's a missing woman. Dee's actually in yes. the in the process of arranging a memorial. Well, it's not a memorial event, an event to sort of mark the ten year disappearance of her best friend Gina, who's sort of like a Susie Lamplu type figure, um, and she sort of haunts the narrative. Um, and I, I yeah, I, I, I like to have two different points of view because I think then that sort of breaks it up a little, and you just get interested in one story, and you can leave that, you know, with, on a on a question or a. A, a, you know, and a, 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 some some kind of eventful um, thing that's happened, and then you're moving on to the next chapter. So the reader is anxious to get back to that, but they're also then get interested in the new person and what's happening to them. Exactly, so, they're, uh, yeah. they're very complex lives, the various characters, don't they? As they, as they, I love the fond fond farewells detail of the. Um, the funeral parlour, um, well, that was fun. There was both, you know, and, and you got the way thingy call, which was great, because I think one thing that can happen if you do alternate points of view is that sometimes you want you want to get too much back to the other one, but I really yes. by both sets of people. I enjoyed writing them both. I think that's the thing. I think you have to really, you know, I think if I enjoyed writing one more than the other, I think there'd be a problem there. But yeah. because I was anxious to get back to both of them, I think that kept me um, interested as well. Yeah. as I was writing it. It's fascinating. And Sam, for you, point of view, was it was it a struggle for you to decide who's, how you wanted to tell the story, who we were gonna, whose eyes we were going to see it through? Or, I mean, it feels very natural in this, but... I think once I'd, once I'd uh, worked out Lucy's uh, story and, and it was going to be a story about Lucy, then it, it, it all felt very natural. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, it could only really been been told through her eyes, I think, this story, because... The, the, the main point is she just at the start she really doesn't know what's going on exactly. and there's really no one else who can help her and so she's 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 just thrown into this and she's just got to use every possible means to just try and find um find a way out of it but i'm i'm a, I'm a bit like leslie really with with kind of chapters and, and 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 how i tend to write and i think i think really if you're a thriller writer you you want things to be propulsive. You want to propel a reader through the book, um, and this sense of things speeding up. And you can do that with chapter length. And actually, sometimes find not just necessarily with the chapters, but actually, you know, sentence structure um, that is affected as well. And you know, as something is happening, my my sentences tend to start getting shorter as well. Yeah, shorter, they clip um, along. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. No, it's great. And the thing about Lucy is that we're seeing things through her eyes, um, and you're able to employ a huge amount of effectively narrative misdirection because we believe what she sees because she believes it herself. Um, and so we miss things and we are suspicious of people. And I thought it was Lucy was, was all behind it at one point. And I just was all the way through. I couldn't see what was going on at all really until we got to the end, which I thought was fantastic. Well, I, I always like writing about characters who um, you're rooting for but you're not necessarily 100% convinced of their motives at the start. Yeah, that's um, absolutely, that's nailed it. That describes exactly what she's like, yeah. And I, and I do that because that's the kind of characters I like reading about. Yeah. Uh, I, re I really like those, those the, you know, rooting for someone while wondering if I should be rooting for someone is uh, always gives me a kind of an in, in, in interesting tension when I'm reading. And yeah. so that's something I always, yeah, I, I, I enjoy creating. That whole thing and charity. We 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 are misdirected slightly in your book too because we have there are, there are some fabulous characters um, who who come out. Emily is just gorgeous. She's an illustrator. She lives in London. She comes out back to New Zealand uh, to look after Felix, um, and we meet her next door neighbours. Um, it's a very it's a probably slightly slower paced book. It's very this beautiful depth, beautiful descriptions of the landscape, and and it's why I want to talk to you about location uh, if we have time. I think we will, um, because location is very significant in all the books. Um, and and you said you wanted to write a book set in the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, so how did the, did the characters arrive? Who arrived first in your head? Was it through your mother's papers and your and Felix first, or both together? I thought um, I. I wanted to set the, the, um, the book in the Ruhenes, which we'll probably talk about later. It mm. seemed to really, um, that, it was, that was definitely where I wanted to be next, partly because I was living somewhere else. 
And um, so when I began to think about the plot, I mean, you know, what could happen? Um, and, you know, you've probably all have the same experience. Plots go round and round in your head and you put it's a bit like making a jigsaw. You know, you're trying to shelve pieces in and they won't fit and you, you move them around a bit. And then and then uh, one day um, you realize you, you've you've got the plot. You've got you've got the whole thing. At least that's that's how I do it. Yeah. Um, so at that stage, I ha already had the idea of Emily that would be somebody. She's about 47, Emily. She's lived overseas for a long time. Um, well, actually, since 1994, when Leia Parata disappeared. So, uh, you know, I did. Um, yeah, there is always a possibility that Emily knows more about it that, uh, than she's saying. Of course, that her father, um, Felix, knows more about it um, than he's saying. Um, and that other people in this quite close-knit community um, yeah. have never forgotten ever that a young woman disappeared and was never seen again in, in, their, in their town. Um, so all those characters, I mean, you could, of course, as you write, you're building up those characters and you might change. One might um, become more significant because suddenly you like them so much. Um, but, but overall, I'd say Emily and her father, Felix and Raywin all arrived around the same time. Yeah, as I was yeah. writing the plot. Mm. Oh, great. And yeah, again, we have that narrative misdirection because there are an awful lot of characters who you think maybe know more than you just you're not sure are you you're not sure as, as the thing evolves and the story evolves and we learn more about her disappearance and what else what else was happening at the time um there are more people who could have been involved um and yes as you read you're just waiting to find out what happens next um and I love the sense I loved you've all got sort of houses I suppose are very significant in in the in your stories um Leslie obviously yours is the apartment upstairs the house where the murder happened is very significant um the garden I don't want to give anything away here but you you know the whole um the whole sort of layout of everything and the way it, it sits um and i i love reading because i'd actually just done an event in woolwich when i picked it up and i was like oh well, i've never been here so what tell us about that did the house come that particular house come in the straight away well i've always been fascinated with houses and i actually lived in, in that that street. I mean, I I don't name the street, but I do name it, it as the street where Fusilier Lee yes. Ripley was murdered, and that yes. was the street where I used to live um, when I lived in London. And um, <clears throat> I do remember being on the bus, looking at the the flowers, you know, the, the flags and things. But yeah, those houses on that particular stretch of road in between Woolwich and Charlton. It's called Little Heath, the bit where I used to live. Um, they're they're very big, imposing houses. Some of them are big, detached houses. Some of them are semis. Um, a lot of them have been made into flats or apartments and um, and some of them are very well maintained and beautiful and others are a little more run down and neglected and quite scary looking. And, uh, you know, as a, as a crime writer, I suppose we're always drawn to the scarier looking ones. And I used to sort of, as I would go by, walk by or go by on the bus on my way to work, I would often think, you know, not not who lived in a house like that, but who might have died in a house like that? Because um, some of them do look quite creepy. So yeah, ha houses and, and, and those sort of um, big Victorian sort of villas ha have always interested me. Um, and because London and that part of London, there's such a mixture of people, you know, all different classes, all different races, all living together. And that makes a great sort of melting pot of, of humanity really to, to explore in a in a crime novel. crime novel yeah we get a very very strong sense of that you get a very strong sense of london and the bus the bus is just i think such a great opening um and her arriving um and and then when d comes she's coming up to the front door again and the house the significance of the house is there yes d has to sort of visit because she's a, the funeral um undertaken she has to um she has to visit and do a home visit and introduction that's where she meets um she meets scarlet for the first time meets scarlet for the first time yeah and, and sam mortis point what a brilliant name for an area lucy lives in this mausoleum of a house doesn't she um and when we meet her in that very very first scene um she's wrapped up in a big bath towel and she's going through a whole load of her papers and this herring gull knocks on the window um i love the symbolism of the herring gull coming through because it pops back later doesn't it um and bangs on the window but mortis point was great is that based on somewhere did you have did the house disappear or is it based on somewhere that you're familiar with uh, the, the house itself just appeared and, and the, the the town the town um is a place called Skentelli, which uh, the, the town is, is is loosely based on um but it for me the, the real location of the rising tide i think um was the sea yes uh, and that was time. that was the um 
that, that was the place that I was most interested in, in going. And um, I grew up in Southampton by the sea. So uh, all my, well, half my family had, had, had always been, um, I've got a huge history with the sea and I'd, I'd worked it. And my, my great grandfather, if I can tell you a quick story, um, my, he, he'd worked all his life on the White Star Lines. Um, oh. um, and uh, in 1912, he'd, he'd heard about this new ship called the Titanic. And he begged his foreman if he could actually, he was a waiter, if he could get a job on it. Um, and his, his, his wish came true. And so my, my great uh, grandmother sort of took him down to the, the, the port that morning and he went up onto the Titanic. And if you look back at the records, you'll find that none of the, none of the male waiters on the Titanic survived, not a single one of them. Um, but when he found his foreman on the Titanic um, and, and tried to find his berth, the guy said to him, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we've got another ship that's just come into uh, into dock and they're understaffed. So I really need to move you off off the Titanic onto that one. I promise you, you can have a go on the second uh, on the second outing. So he went back down the gangplank and uh, and onto wow. the ship. Um, wow. But for me, for me that was important because he hadn't had any children at this stage. So my <laughs> that was very important. Hadn't been born. So if it had gone the other way, I, you I wouldn't would be here. That's an amazing story. Incredible. That's brilliant. brilliant. Makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck, doesn't it? It's, oh, wow. It's always been with me that. And I, I think I've always had this, you know, sense that the sea can very quickly change things. Yeah. Uh, but also as a, as a thriller writer, when you're setting when you're setting books in the UK and you're putting people into situations where really they've got to fight out of, it's it's sometimes quite hard to find a place where help is not just a phone call away um, or, or a shout away. It's one of the reasons I set my, my first novel was in um, inside a country estate where, you know, um, some miles, from, miles from anywhere. But that's another great thing about the sea as a setting, I think, is, you know, you sail, you sail a few miles or seven miles off, off, off land and you, you can't see it anymore. And there's, there's, there's no one else around, but, you know, uh, Coast Guard can find can can listen to um, your calls for help, but they can't necessarily pinpoint you. They can see where roughly the direction of your uh, call for help help might come from, but they'll have no idea how far away you are. So it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a good setting, I think. For, it's brilliant, uh, you capture the sea so well, and the and the the power of the sea, I think, and the just yeah, I was shivering for most of it because it, it's very wet and it's cold and it's um, it just yeah, it's just lashing, isn't it really? And the storm is there, and it's just everything's happening at once. Um, I thought it was a fantastic setting and really really brilliantly realised. Um, yeah, and I love the beachside bar too because I've got a really sense. We've got a very strong sense of community there, um, and all the different characters in the in living in the village um, came across very, very clearly and were, and were important then um, as potential suspects as, well, as we as we read on. Uh, were they based on? They were obviously weren't based on anybody in particular. Though the, she says quickly. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't, add, but... I don't. I don't. My characters usually aren't based on anyone I know. Although I do tend to pick. Um, pick things that have happened to me or pick things that happened in my, my daily life tend to make it into the book. One, I think one thing that always happens, my, my wife is always my first reader when I've written something and she's usually shocked to discover that something she thought was quite a sweet memory between me and her has been, has been taken and put into a book and has been, uh, been twisted somehow into something quite dark. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, the characters, uh, I had, I had fun uh, with the characters in the rising tide because I think, you know, in, in that kind of setting, you can, you can get some quite quirky individuals and yeah they're quite extreme and it, we felt that we got that extreme environment and and the characters yeah are quite quirky aren't they and very individual so um it's yeah really really enjoyed them and charity for you we've got that strong sense of community too haven't we but it's a disparate community because it's spread um the location I, I love the name of the house Ar arapito is that how you pronounce arapito. it yeah arapito yeah. end of the path is that yeah. and that's I just was perfect the perfect name is that is that something that was in your head as well as you were as you were writing I spent ages finding that name for that name for that particular you know the house in, in that area you always you spend always spend ages thinking about what name is going to fit and what's going to work but um, when I discovered it meant enter the path I said yes perfect, perfect. in yeah. Tyrell Māori um, I'd written the previous book I'd written was set in a cafe in sat in Balham in London and so it was all with it was a siege so it was a, a, a book set within four walls within about 18 hours in a day which was a particular challenge yes and so yeah. the next one it was quite liberating to, contrast. Uh, to do the opposite <laughs> and, and and move out into this sort of mountainous 
or into a, a, a massive mountainous landscape um, down the centre of New Zealand of the North Island. Um, there are various mountain ranges and um, one of the highest and, um, is the Rohino Range. And, and I moved there, I first saw it years and years ago when I went to visit it with my then boyfriend who you know, he became my husband. And, and then we moved there. And I remember in the, you know, in the mornings, I'd be walking my children to the school bus and, and, and I'd look up and there's these snow-capped mountains towering over us, snow-capped in winter and sort of drowsing in a haze in summer. And every morning I'd say, look at the mountains, the mountains. And nobody else seemed to notice them. And I thought this is extraordinary. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I really wanted to, um, to notice them, to give them a to give them a personality and a place because they're so extremely powerful living under a range like that. And at night, I remember when we first moved there being particularly sort of spooked because at night you couldn't see the lights of any other human at all of any sort, I know any other sign of human life. So you go out, if you turned all the lights off in the house and went outside, it was, it was utterly black with the Milky Way crackling overhead, sort of, sort of singing. Now, sometimes we see the International Space Station and get really excited because there's people up there. So it was that intense isolation, I suppose, that I really, um, really just wanted to explore and um, set a mystery in it. Yeah, it's, it's such a fabulous location. I mean, the locations, the locations, you've woven the locations so well into each of the stories um, that they really, could, you know, you don't feel they could be anywhere else. Um, and that, that, yeah, that sense of the Milky Way. And I think there is a point where they walk out, Emily walks out and it's completely black. Um, and, you know, the stars above crackling is a lovely way to describe it, isn't it? Because it's just, yeah, no, no sense of the loom. I think we, those of us who live in cities have no sense of that that darkness that level of darkness because there's always loom somewhere from from the city so it's um that was amazing and and, and very significant in the story because leah's going up into the mountains um and the search parties that go to look for her are going up into the mountains in in quite extreme conditions um and that's very interesting too did you do a lot of research on the search and rescue end of things Yes, yes, I did. Uh, um, there's always a lot of research, isn't there? But uh, yes, anybody I could find who'd had anything to do with search and rescue, I'd say, oh, let me buy you a cup of coffee um, and you know, talk to them. And I read newspaper articles and watched videos and read books about it and trawled through the news going back years and uh, about searches and rescues, particularly in New Zealand and particularly in the North Island. But I was trying to also trying to make it accurate for 1994 Mm. where there were different, um, you know, uh, uh, different technology. Nowadays, you could carry um, a personal locator beacon, for example. But in fact, my, my father-in-law uh, was a pilot. Well, he's a farmer, but he also made his own planes. He was an aerobatics pilot, but he went down over those mountains or actually somewhat further north in 1991 and was killed and it took in his little plane but it took um a long time for, for the wreckage to be found and then for the searchers to walk in and get to it took a, a long long time you know, days i think to get to walk to it so i i was able to go back and ask people about that do you remember what what did you have in those days how would you how would you start to look for somebody um what was available and i remembered going up with him just before then, I'd been visiting New Zealand and my father-in-law took me on a search and rescue expedition in his plane. So we quartered, we, we, we flew up and down. He was smoking his pipe, made me feel sick, but we flew up and down. You know, you were given a, 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 a large area to go up and down, up and down, up and down. So I had experienced something of what it felt like to be in a small plane looking for this needle in a haystack. It, re it really is. It, you, most people... Um, it's very hard to imagine, but about a person a year goes missing in the back country in New Zealand, and very often they're never just yes, never, never found. found. God, mm. incredible, incredible, and, and same in the sea too, Sam, isn't it? Because you did a lot of research on the lifeboats and the um, yeah people just disappearing. The, the lifeboat stuff was really interesting. Yeah, I every, when I every time I have to do research, I'm always nervous that I'm going to not be able to find someone to help me. But actually, I, I'm and then I start doing it, and I'm always amazed about how. Prepare, how easily prepared people are to, to give up their time and, and, and share 
you know, what they do. And so with the rising tide, particularly, I had to make sure, I mean, there's a lot of lifeboat rescue in there. There's a lot of um, uh, Coast Guard activity as well. So I, 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 I had to get on top of that. And um, it was difficult at the time because it was in the middle of COVID. And so it wasn't the case that you could just easily just go and pop down to a lifeboat station and speak to somebody because every, everything was, was, was closed um, up and or nobody was seeing anyone. And yes, they were still active, but they, they certainly didn't want a writer turning up and nosing around. But um, they were really helpful. And I, I spoke to um, yeah, quite a lot of people on the telephone. We had we had Zoom calls like like this. And, uh, you know, one guy even took me around um, by um, with, with his camera all around the cockpit of his um uh, of his lifeboat and uh, and so yeah it, it um, you always find out some really interesting stuff when you talk to these people and sometimes when in the in the course of telling talking to them you find things out that you then end up incorporating into the into the book and things happen just through those conversations where you were literally trying to find out you know how fast does this boat go and then you'll hear a story and you think god that actually weaves in really nicely so um yeah, so so research is always something I approach with a bit of trepidation and really enjoy it once I'm in the middle of, you know, meeting new people and speaking to them about what they do. Yeah, and Leslie, I can see you nodding there. Um, definitely. I mean, because because Gina disappeared and she's sort of the um, backstory, I suppose, story disappearance, because this is your book isn't just about one thing going going one person going missing. Um, that would have required a good bit of research, too, because, again, that was back in, in you know, 20 odd years ago, wasn't it? Yes, I suppose that, that, yeah, I was inspired by the Susie Lamplew story. Mm. I've always been interested in that case because she went missing. I can't remember the exactly, it might've been 86, can't mm. remember offhand. I, I remember it very clearly. Yeah. Um, when I was a young woman as well. And yeah. so I identified with that story very much and I fo I've always followed it. And mm. I think when I started to write The Apartment Upstairs, I didn't necessarily have that thread in mind, but I was, in the way a writer's mind works, I was. I think I was watching a documentary about the disappearance of Susie Lamplew. And then I thought, oh, that would be an interesting sort of storyline to, to, to weave in. I mean, obviously it isn't about her, but it's no, no, but it, it, yeah, inspired, inspired by, by yeah. that. But I mean, in terms of research, you know, I, I enjoy doing research. I, I interviewed my friend who is the funeral, funeral home. Parent, and she, I, mean, I love she, those bits. Yeah, and she, I mean, she talked to me about sort of small funeral firms and because she's worked with some of the big funeral firms and also the very small, because there's no regulation with, with funeral in, um, firms actually. Um, and she took me around um, Golders Green crematorium. So I saw the sort of, you know, the business end of a crematorium, didn't actually use any of that stuff, but I felt it was useful. So I was sort of, to, to, you know, even just a little sentence here and there, you get that authenticity that I wouldn't have, wouldn't have found otherwise yeah I think that extra research comes through doesn't it even if you don't actually mention that you the fact that you know it yes. and it's something your characters would know and would be second nature to them it's, it does bubble through because yeah the, and that you mentioned there right at the very start about the green funeral approach and that's I was fascinated by that again you know people people, people being planted under trees and in wicker yeah. it was just it was yeah. very although of course you can't be planted right under exactly so this root, is it. tell us about the trees will, and the roots. well the roots will grow through the body so mm -hmm. a lot of people think you know so when you have a woodland burial you ha you can be buried in sight of trees near trees but not actually under them <laughs> Sort of interesting snippet. All of those facts you didn't know, you needed to know, <laughs> definitely. Oh, goodness me. Now, we've got a couple of questions coming in already. Uh, so I'm just going to switch over to and have a little look at those. Um, I can't see you when I'm reading them. So um, there's one for each of you, which is fantastic. Um, Sam, why did the paragraph sit for 15 years? That's a very good question. And why did it come back when it did, that first one? It is a good question. I... Um... I think it sat there for a few years because I didn't know what to do with it, and I, I didn't um, I didn't have any plan with it, and and same with the other paragraph, and uh, it just felt like the time to sit down with a piece of paper and write them down and and, yeah. and try and connect them, and that's what that's what this really was about. It was a kind of a process of discovery. How you know what is this story about? Where is it going? And and I, I knew a, a possible ending. I knew roughly where I was going to start, and it was a case of just just fitting them in um, and finding out what happened in the middle. But why why was it so long? I think I had lots of other things. I mean, ideas come all the time and, and you, you, you pick ones that you want to work on at the time and you leave some to just percolate, I think. And this one needed a, a longer time to percolate. 
Yeah, I think that's really interesting that you do. Yeah, you can get half a story, half an idea, and it, and it and it takes that long for the other bits to join and it for it to become a bigger idea, doesn't it? I think Stephen King talks about great story being the collision of two unrelated ideas, um, and you know, bringing those things together are what gave you the rising tide. So that's fascinating. I think and I guess you know, an idea has got legs if it doesn't leave you, if it's mm, always yeah. percolating away. Yeah, and sometimes you just have a feeling and they come and go, don't they? Yeah. That's it. You have a feeling that there's another bit that you need, yeah. and you just have to wait for it. I mean, same thing happened with my first book, actually, which was that it wasn't a sentence as much as a character. I had a character in mind uh, of this uh, 12 year old boy and he'd, he'd, he'd been in the back of my head for years and years. And with that book, I just sat down one day and said, right, I'm going to tell this story. Um, but yeah, things things stick around and it's the ones that don't leave you, as you say, are the ones probably worth pursuing. The good ones. Excellent. Now, what have we got next? Uh, Leslie, um, how did you, oh yeah, this is another good question. How do you find writing in third person compared with first? Because that's, you made, you sound, made it sound very easy there, but sometimes it isn't, is it? Well, actually, um, yeah, it was a little different, but in many ways, um, I mean, it was, I, I write in close third person, which is very similar to first person in many ways, because you're it's not a sort of omniscient third person where you're sort of popping into a lots of people's heads. You're writing very much from from the perspective of the character whose head you're in at that time. Um, so in that respect, it's quite similar to writing in first person. But um, there are differences. And I, I enjoyed it because I hadn't done it before, you know, my first three novels were all in the first person. Um, I think there's there's advantages to writing in the first person when you're writing a psychological thriller because you can really get inside someone's head and it, when the reader's reading it, it feels like they are that person sort of thing. They really perhaps identify more closely. So I think there is a danger with third that you can maybe distance the reader, but that's why you you know you, if you write in close third person, I think it's it's it, it, it's very similar. Um, the novel I'm writing at the moment, honestly, I can't I can't decide what person. To write. I started off writing it in first, I switched to third, and now I'm seriously considering going back to first. So I think I need to finish it first and then make that decision. <laughs> oh gosh, and then change it. Oh, oh goodness me, that's a huge job. And and did did Scarlett did she come to you as a as a in that third person voice? Is that how you made the decision? Yes, to... she did, because I was thinking of her as I, you know, as I was sitting on the bus. It sounds makes makes me sound like I'm like seeing people, seeing but you can see the bus. I'm there I with you on the bus. The back of her head, yes. Yeah. And I saw her get up. So I, yeah, I suppose I did, I was thinking of her as a character, therefore she appeared to me as in the third person. Yeah. Um, but I do, I did experiment. I mean, I, I'm sure the others are the same. You experiment writing in different, maybe for a paragraph or two in first person or third and see what takes. And it just seemed to work in the third person. So I thought I'll go, I'll go with this. Yeah, certainly, certainly did. Worked extremely well. Thank now uh, charity um a huge topic to take on and wonderfully handled um and this uh, the, the our speaker says um she's only read sn snippets but it's so emotional um and it really is your book really isn't and as i did mention earlier that i was sobbing all the way through the particularly around the ending um, and i didn't expect the ending at all um so there was a wonderful so sort of a wonderful twist at the end um as well as us being completely overwhelmed did you when you started it did you know what the ending was going to be have to do yes. like giving anything away really um yes no i did i i what by the time i actually began to write it i did know what the ending was going to be and what the structure was going to be and i was thinking when leslie was talking about the 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 first and third person and i've had that experience where you've written a whole book in one and then gone back turned the whole thing into something else and mm. that's quite an interesting process isn't it where you're thinking in the third person but then you move into the first and how the vocabulary is different even yeah. if it's quite a close um, but with this I, I wrote it all from from Emily's point of view so um, uh, but then I knew that at, at, at a stage towards the end it would move into somebody else's voice um, without giving too much away and okay. so that but in in a different way again yeah um, because it's because it's through um because it's through a, a sort of reminiscence so that was that was really um I knew that was coming and I suppose I was getting ready to write in that voice all the way through I was getting to know that character so by the time it came to write that part I I knew who they were and I knew how they would write so that actually flowed um quite easily and I need so knowing that was coming really helped yeah, yeah. Actually, with the structure of the rest of the book 
Yeah, and the little bits of foreshadowing, which obviously you're, you're experts at doing now, laying in those little details that uh, we don't see as readers, but it's only when we're finished at the end and we go back and then we... <gasps> Yes. That, that, was, that, that was there that all the time. Um, no, really, really, really brilliant. And um, Leslie, I, I actually mentioned to you earlier when we were talking about what we were going to chat about. Um, I wanted to ask you what your favourite books were, because obviously we've got a lot of readers watching. Um, Leslie, what, what's your favourite book or do you have anything that you go back to often? It's, you know, it's impossible to, to pick a favourite book, especially when you read so many and so many books have influenced me. But I think what got me interested in crime fiction in my 20s and 30s, I devoured all of Ruth Rendell's work. And, but you know, she also wrote as Barbara Vine, her more psychological thrillers. And so I could pick any number of those. But I think the one that really resonates is um, a, a, a Judgment in Stone, because that, I think that was her finest. I mean, I mean, it's got that famous first line where you know everything right up front, but it still manages to hold, you know, the, the first sentence is Eunice Parchman killed the Coverdale family because she could not read or write. And so, you know, the crime that's happened straight away and the fact that she can, keep, you know, and then it's narrated in such a sort of cold, distinctive voice throughout. And you it's not so much a, a who done it, but a why done it. And as a writer of psychological suspense, that's what interests me. I'm not interested in the gore. I mean, there's a little, tiny little bit of gore in my novel, but not much, you know. And of course, you know, you've got that last, I won't give any spoilers because there may be readers who, people who haven't read it, but there's that last gasp sort of surprise, even though you think you know everything, the last few pages are a surprise. And so I think that really, resonated with me that novel but anything written by Ruth Rendell or or her other pen name Barbara Vine yeah. would, would, would be my favourite yeah, I think yeah I love love hearing of first lines I think it's fantastic Sam for you what, what what's your, what's your uh... I've always been a huge Stephen King fan but actually if if I, if I had to pick one book um I it would it would definitely be The Hobbit actually um because that's the that's the book that my my dad brought home when I was about five or six years old and, and said, I'd, I've heard of this book and let's let's read it together. And Wonderful. for the for the I don't know, for a period of about a month, he used to come into my room every night and read a chapter and I'd ask for more. And he, I don't know how many times we, we did it over, over over the months, but uh, that book just absolutely obsessed me and um, and maybe want to write as well. And I remember, you know, within a year or so, I was filling exercise books. I think when you're a writer, the first thing you do is you start telling other people's stories and then you learn to tell your own stories. And my first experience was was, was as a little kid trying to, to rewrite The Hobbit. And uh, and then I, I, I just got the bug really um, because of that book and uh, just kept writing ever, ever since and eventually started telling my own stories. Oh, that's wonderful. That's gorgeous. Charity for you? I know what you mean, Sam, actually. And it's and, and also, less it's impossible to pick one because there's so many, you know, is it Bill Bryson who makes you laugh? Is it, um, you know, crime writer that, that, that keeps you turning the pages? And I, I think going back to, um, as, as you did, Sam, to my earliest days, you know, the book that sort of probably changed my life and made me want to write stories was um, Watership Down, Richard Adams's Watership Down. I remember I read it. I, I read it countless times. I, I couldn't even say on two hands, you know, it, I must have read it 20 times as a child again and again and again. I used to put on Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake and listen, read this book. Um, wow. And as quite a sort of lonely, isolated child living in Birmingham at that time, um, this book was my companion and my brother queued up in the rain to get me a signed copy signed by Richard Adams himself and wow and I've still got it uh, to this day and I remember this moment when um, I, I was reading about uh, the, the rabbits who are in the um, they're just escaping from Ephrafer this is terrifying the suspense that you were talking about there's a the scenery and and we're terrified because we really care about these rabbits and the outcome for them could be really violent and and the weather, there's a sense of the buildup of the storm, but it hasn't yet broken and there's a crystalline quality in the air. And I remember thinking, I know exactly what he's talking about. I'd, I'd moved from Yorkshire to Birmingham as a young child and I was missing Yorkshire. I see, I know what it's like in the countryside when the air is heavy with the storm and there's this crystalline light that's coming through the clouds and it's all about to break and you know, the raindrops are about to churn up the ground and, uh, and that sense that the writer was reaching out to me 
in my little bedroom was magical. And I suppose that's what I've been trying to chase ever since. Wow. Wow. That, that just makes us want to read all of those books. That's, that's incredible. Um, one last question has just come in and we've literally got one minute left. So quick fire round. What is your top tip for writers? Leslie, what would you? Oh, read. Read as much as you can in the genre in which you want to write um, because you learn so much from reading other people's novels. Yeah, I learned loads from reading yours. Go on, Sam. <laughs> Uh, I'd say when you're writing, uh, the temptation often is to just just describe a scene through what you might see. Um, but actually, we experience we experience life through all five of our senses, and that should happen in fiction as well. Yeah, excellent, great tip, Charity. I agree with all of that, uh, but mine will be edit, edit, edit. I'm over reading books that aren't properly edited, and and it shows. And um, we and we all need we all we know we all need to do it. So. Um, I find I say to you know new writers that are starting out, and certainly it's something I had to learn to do was just keep on editing, keep ironing until it's smooth. Yeah, keep going, keep going, keep writing. Just keep writing was the best advice I was ever given. So on that note, keep editing, keep reading. Um, the apartment upstairs, Leslie Cara, The Rising Tide by Sam Lloyd and Remember Me by Charity Norman are three books that I could not recommend highly enough. As one of my, my eldest always says, 10 out of 10, highly recommend. Um, so thank you so much for joining me. Thank Getting you. insight into your work and the books has been absolutely fascinating. Um, and um, you'll be able to watch back this, um, or people who've maybe missed it will be able to watch it back um, and be able to get hold of all those books um, that you have recommended. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, thank Sam. You. Thank, you. thank you. And thank you very much indeed to the Reading Agency for having us all. Indeed. <laughs>